and welcome to this wonderful pre-concert talk. Welcome, Lori. Thank you, Gary. I'm delighted to be here for a couple of reasons. First of all, we're presenting two composers whom I think are making their initial appearance ever on this series. And the second is that A Bridge of Searing Beauty is clearly a reference to the second of them, Frank Bridge, but the first, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, actually is an important bridge figure between the high classic era and the Rococo that immediately preceded it. I have actually a personal connection to Chevalier. One of my colleagues, Gabriel Benat, actually wrote what I think is a definitive guide to Chevalier. And I remember when he was researching it, he traveled all over Europe. He was pretty much the expert in his work, in his life, and really an admirer of Chevalier de Saint-Georges long before it became popular. I love this particular drawing that your colleague Chomet Pelletier did. She's been a lifetime artist as well as a lifetime violinist, and she published a book of the African-American composers and, and, and artists as well, but this was a drawing she did specially for me, so I'm very proud of it. And well, you should be, because she caught the two most important aspects of him. He's not only holding a violin and a bow, he's also boasting a sword at his side. For uh, audience members who are not familiar with his story, we should explain that he was the son of a French planter who lived in the West Indies on the island of Guadeloupe. And he fathered a child with his black slave, a woman named Nanon. He took the woman and the baby with him back to France and the Chevalier was actually reared with the finest education and training and he demonstrated extraordinary gifts as a fencer, as a swordsman. He wasn't really a man yet, but when he was 12 or 13. And that led to an appointment in the King's Guard that earned him the title of Chevalier. Europe adopted him as their own, and he was a star. We don't actually know very much about his teachers, but we've inferred from dedications by contemporary composers of the time who were his likely teachers for composition and for violin. And he obviously evolved into a very gifted violinist because he became the concertmaster in one of his teacher's orchestras by the 1770s, and in the 1780s, he was actually directing the Concert de la Loge Olympique, which was the organization that commissioned the six symphonies we know as Haydn's Paris symphonies. So he must have been quite capable on the violin. You've looked at a couple of his concerti, haven't you? His concerti and chamber music are very challenging. Certainly for the time, a lot of it would be known as unplayable. So clearly he wrote it for himself, much like Mozart wrote piano music concertos for himself, and his technique was formidable. He, I think, understood the instrument very well. We should remind our audience that there was no Baroque violin at the time. There was only one violin, and the, just like the Baroque bow. Maybe a, he had a transitional bow, but the short fingerboard, the gut strings, all of that made for an instrument that was very elegant, but there's no question that when he played up high in position, it was probably straining the dimensions of the fingerboard. The modern fingerboard is a few inches longer than the Baroque fingerboard. He was also a pioneer in the evolution of the string quartet. This set of quartets, which appeared in 1773 as his Opus One, they're smaller in dimensions from the quartets that we're more familiar with, for example, of Haydn's, which are four movements. They're only two movements, each of them but they are among the earliest quartets to have been written by an essentially French composer and published in Paris. And I'm so struck by the parallel in the one that you are performing this afternoon because you've chosen a quartet that is in G minor and just about anything in minor mode was unusual in the 1770s. For sure, there's a drama to it, but it's a very different drama from the drama, let's say, of Haydn. There is real stress in the music of Haydn, and in, to my ear, this is not real stress. It's more of a darkened cloud than it was actual drama and something that was dark, um, G minor being a, a key oftentimes of tragedy, but there's very little tragedy here. Agreed. We should explain that the German term 
Sturm und Drang literally means storm and stress. It actually grew out of German literature, uh, but the way it manifested itself in music was a pushing against the well-mannered, pleasing sonorities that the mid 18th century audiences had become accustomed to. I find the Chevalier's use of minor mode to manifest itself in a very different, more aristocratic way and less stormy than Haydn. Nevertheless, we still have to acknowledge that G minor is an unusual key for the time. I think he was also very skillful. I alluded to some of the technical challenges in, in the, the intricate passage work here. He wrote them to show off his technique as well as his compositional prowess. So in some ways it was beautiful. It would be something that the patrons would really enjoy and still remember that they couldn't play. I agree with you, but I think we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Let's take a listen to the beginning of this first movement and specifically the G minor tonality. So it is in G minor, but at the same time, it's very clearly organized in four measure phrases. What's really surprising to me is what he does when he makes the expected modulation to the relative major, because all of a sudden he starts to strut his stuff as a first violinist. We get triplets and then we get passage work that really show what an accomplished player this guy was. Let's listen. So we see here that his dedicatee was a member of the nobility, which we would expect because he was moving in the aristocratic circles of Paris. And also the way he was writing would have been things that the aristocracy would have expected. They wanted to be entertained. They wanted music that was new. But what I love about that example is that he's showing us what we call the Baroque violin, what it was capable of. And my understanding, Gary, is that he probably was working with an early version of the torch bow that was introduced at just about this time. It's very possible. Yes, he used some kind of a transitional bow or even the early torch bows. One thing we do know is that he was in the creme de la creme of aristocracy. He was a very curious uh, musician. We got to remember that the Stradivarius died in 1737. He would have known all about the, the great <laughs> instruments of Cremona and probably sought them out when they're not millions of dollars like they are now. Very, very rare still in his day. So I have a feeling from his compositions that he used every faculty at his disposal to be able to figure out what the instrument is capable of doing and then some. We mentioned earlier that all of these first six quartets of his are limited to two movements and several of them are minuets with trios. This one is a rondo in duple time. Now, rondo does not mean the same thing in the French spelling that it does when we think of a rondo. It's more like a refrain that might recur, but this one's in clearly two-part form, and it's a wonderful example of the style that's making the transition from the rococo to the high classic. goodness, look at him fencing here. And he's fencing with a lady. Who would have expected that? Can you imagine fencing in that long skirt? That would be very unfair. I can't imagine it's extremely comfortable in the gentleman's breeches either, but good for him. And evidently he was very skilled, as we said. So this rondo theme, once again, clear four bar phrases in the second half of it, which is really the middle section, it would correspond to a trio in a minuet trio. He does go into major mode. It's the first time we've heard it in G major, the parallel major. Let's listen. Mm -hmm. 
careful listeners will have noticed that he's using the same basic motive that he used in the rondeau part of it, but he's put it in major mode and he continues and goes off in a slightly different melodic direction. This is called monothematicism and it is a technique that Haydn used a great deal in his own compositions. And once again, I'm so struck by the unlikely parallel between this essentially French composer who might have heard some of Haydn's music, but was functioning several countries away. It was quite a distance from Paris to Vienna and Eisenstadt in those days. And uh, with the anchor work on the program, the Frank Bridge Piano Quintet, we can see a really fine example of how late Romanticism was starting to peek forward into what we call the modern era. Frank Bridge is such an interesting composer to me. So few people think of him when they think of English music, and yet he was a really important seminal figure. Like Elgar, he was born in the 19th century, came into his early maturity and his first success in the first years of the 20th century. Bridge is unusually interesting because he has his own English voice, but at the same time, it's so clear that he was influenced by the heavy late romantic harmonies of Richard Wagner that were so influential in the last years of the 19th century. And yet there is respect for form that I think shows his classical training and his reverence for Johannes Brahms. And at the same time, his use of harmony and particularly his piano technique to me recalls Faure and to some extent César Franck. How do these things affect the way he wrote for strings, Gary? It's actually wonderful that you mentioned Brahms and Wagner. Um, the string writing is very curious because technically it's not terribly demanding just in terms of passage work, but it is terribly demanding in terms of color and texture. And in some ways, his music, a little bit like music of Elgar, is also all about the way he treats the instruments as a whole. In this quintet, for example, we are forced, if you will, to really homogenize the tone. Oftentimes the quartet in some ways plays against the piano, and I think a lot of the harmonic and musical tension is actually derived from layering as opposed to giving certain instruments certain solos. This quintet originated in the very early years of the 20th century. He drafted it from late 1904 to about spring of 1905, but he wasn't satisfied with it and he tucked it away for a long time, then pulled it out and dusted it off a number of years later. I found that equally fascinating because he made a much tighter, better organized work in the revision, and I see another direct parallel with Brahms there. Most of the revisions took place in the inner movements. The first version of the quintet was for four movements. I want to uh, spend some time on the remarkable first movement, which has a very brief, slow introduction and then just rumbles and explodes and makes you think of 1930s suspense movie music the way it unfolds. Let's listen to the slow introduction to the first major statement from the piano with the strings. remarkable way to begin a piano quintet, the rumbling piano. It's both a cello rondo and getting louder in a slow, steady crescendo that almost sounds like Rachmaninoff. And then he gives, amidst all this turbulence, he gives the first theme to the viola, followed shortly by the cello. And when the violin finally gets its hand on it, it's in a different key. Those of us who heard the first concert with the Dvorak Piano Quintet will remember that there is a prominent viola solo both in the Dumki movement and here. To me here, I really hear a lot of César Franck, who also has a very famous piano quintet, and both of them were admirers of Wagner. So I think it's important for us to know that now here we are in the 20th century where the viola and the cello 
really take a prominent step forward and they're the equals to the violins and the pianos of the chamber music repertoire. Well, for me, it's classic. It was a dark and stormy night. That's what this piano introduction makes me feel like. It's wonderfully passionate and hard on the sleeve romantic, but he in classic fashion gives us a second theme that is far more lyrical and he gives it to piano solo. It sounds almost like a nocturne. Let's listen. This piano solo, as I said, it's like a piano nocturne. It's very romantic and to my ears, very French. Eventually he passes the tune to the cello. And again, I'm so struck by some parallels with the Dvorak that we heard last month because there's this emphasis on string instruments that historically have not been at the forefront of the quartet texture. But Bridge is looking for the richness of those inner voices and the frequent changes of key call to mind the modulations both of Cesar Franck and Gabriel Fauré. Also, I would be remiss if we didn't mention that while very French, there is a certain English sensibility to it. Even in rehearsals we were talking about, it, it just seems like the, the British countryside, without anything stormy, I, it, it's, a, it's a sensibility that is in some ways very Welsh, very British, and it's really wonderful for us to explore that because we don't often get that chance. Agreed, but Bridge certainly knew how to plumb the drama whenever he needed to take advantage of it. And you can hear that in this passage from the development section. I find this passage astonishing. There are waves and layers of sound that sound to me like the Liebestode music from Wagner's Tristan, and the way that he pits the piano against the solid body of the four strings. It's almost like waves in an ocean cascading against rocks on a cliff, sending up spray into the air. The audience should pay attention to the actual Steinway that we're using in this performance is a new instrument for us and probably one of the most remarkable instruments that I've ever worked with in this quintet. It's really on display. Everything is heard, all the middle registers, so really love this instrument. We are very lucky indeed. Bridge is so fluid with his melodies. There's so much richness of material there. He introduces a completely new idea in the development that you can hear in this next example. You'll hear it with first with the viola and then with the cello and then the violins combined with the lower strings, finally the piano. So this time the strings get to introduce the new idea. He's unified this whole new idea by sharing it among the five instruments, but at the same time, he takes them through several different key centers, which is completely consistent with what you would expect. I'd like to draw the audience's attention to one thing, and that is what we call tessitura, the range of the string instruments. They're always in the very comfortable range, and if you think about the time that this was written, you had people like Stravinsky, you had people like Ravel, which push the boundaries of the comfort to the ear. And I would say this quintet in many ways is the exact opposite of it. It homogenizes and enriches the comfortable range of the instruments for the greater good of the whole. 
And it's a very interesting way to use the instruments because we are not in our 21st century ears. Really, we don't notice that. I mean, you can play way up high, way low. We don't even notice that. But I think at the turn of the 20th century, this was quite a comforting thing for him and really his signature. I'm so struck by this piano in the image that's on the screen right now because it's got these enormous Victorian legs. But it's also a reminder that at the end of the 19th century, music making in the home was still something that people engaged in on a regular basis. It was a part of the fabric of everyday life. And how great is it that just about every home, every urban home would have a piano. So after dinner, you could have a private musicale and perhaps you could invite some of your friends. I mean, you're looking at four hands piano here, which is a pretty intimate thing. You're sitting next to somebody and really touching them. Well, I think we need to turn our attention now to Bridge's second movement, which is the one where his extensive revisions from the original version had the greatest impact. Essentially, he decided that the first version of the quintet was too long. And the way he solved this problem is by compressing his original second movement, the slow movement, and the third movement, scherzo, into one movement. He trimmed them both, and he interpolated the scherzo as a central episode in the slow movement. It's enormously effective because he opens the slow movement with this luscious, heavenly chorale for the strings. Let's listen. For a big piece, this piece is incredibly subtle. Oftentimes, the late romantic piano quintets can be quite bombastic, and I think a lot of intimacy is present in this quintet. I am reminded that it was hearing a piece of music by Frank Bridge that inspired the young Benjamin Britten to become a composer, and he sought out Bridge as his teacher. I like to think that what he heard, which was an orchestral piece called The Sea, was actually as lush and romantic and tender as that delicious string chorale, but as interesting as the piano interpolating this question that is almost a challenge to the strings without being a dramatic challenge. You know, the great tone poems of the 19th century about the sea, which of course is Scheherazade by Rimsky-Korsakov, and then Conversely, in the 20th century, La Mer by Debussy, this language is completely different from both of them. It has this incredible placid quality, and yet the intimacy that the large group is able to convey and the seamlessness, the dovetailing of the melodies, I think probably Britain was not only taken by it, but learned a lot from it and was inspired by it. There's no doubt, even though, of course, the quintet was not specifically written with a body of water in mind, I'm sure he was fascinated by the fact that an English composer could so capture the magic of French and Russian mystique and yet imprint them with a language that was distinctly British. Our next example has the piano restating the main theme, and now we're going to hear it with the viola adding a counter theme. Let's listen. pretty schmaltzy for an English composer. I hear him looking forward to the sexy harmonies of Cole Porter and the age of American popular song in this. A lot of people have accused this passage to be very much like Rachmaninoff, but I would argue that Rachmaninoff himself would never say that because a lot of this music still kind of never takes you over the edge of passionate romanticism. It just goes to the border of it but never crosses. Yes, and it captures that heavenly atmosphere of the opening string chorale, but it gives it a lot more sensuality. 
when Bridge turns to the scherzo, and I would remind you that he is here interpolating a compressed version of the original longer scherzo, it could not be more of a contrast. And once again, there is a very, very French echo here. To my ears, this sounds so much like the scherzo in the Saint-Saëns Second Piano Concerto. <laughs> This music sparkles in a way that just lights up a room. It has such lightness in both the string writing and the piano writing. It's virtuosic for all five players. What's it like for the strings, Gary? In some ways, though this is a, a typical scherzo, it feels like there's a hemiola in it. It's like it's moving around, like there are extra beats, even though there really aren't. And it also keeps the listener somewhat off balance because of all the irregular rhythms. So you end up participating with the players rather than just listening. It also means that when he returns to the adagio, the calm of that chorale idea is all the more effective because he's gotten your heart rate up there for a while. Let's remember that the actual term scherzo means joke. And this is not the kind of a joke that, let's say, Haydn would have had, or even Mendelssohn. You know, it's not the poke in your ribs joke. <laughs> We no longer have the chorale, but we have the chorale theme in unison strings against this almost ecstatic cascade of arpeggios coming from the piano. It's almost as if the heart is bursting with so much emotion here. It's incredibly pregnant music. It's the only time where the first violin is asked to be in some of the highest register you can play in with the other three strings supporting it so that it doesn't sound hysterical. But the intensity remains there, and I think that it is reinforced by the idea of this unison against the more fluid piano part. So let's move to the finale, which is marked Allegro Energico, and boy, is it filled with energy. Let's listen to the beginning. <laughs> The strings here are urgent. They're playing mostly in unison, sometimes in rhythmic unison, but they're these bold exclamations from the piano. This is take no prisoners music. We spoke about the influences on bridge from other great composers. And of course, Wagner's ever present. But here, I hear César Franck, the great Belgian composer who was also an organist as Saint-Saëns was. This music is very much in the realm of Franck in that it's passionate, in it, but it still has some coolness to it. Quite a lot of harmonic chromaticism. He's not making it obvious what key we're in, and he's hinting at a lot of them, which heightens the tension because we don't have that resolution of a clear harmonic point of arrival. Language of Franck is exactly that, where it does move around all the time. You kind of know where you are, but hard to nail down, and that's part of the beauty of it. Another thing that he has in common with Franck is that he's using a sort of transformation of themes. He's restating them. There's this constant sense of variation in the way he treats his thematic material. I think we can hear that very clearly in the next example. <laughs> 
he's using an ascending second theme and then he has the instruments come in imitating one another and then we hear the two violins in parallel thirds above pizzicato lower strings there's many layers to it but it's quite symphonic and it has this forward trajectory that i find so compelling in bridge love that little solo for the two violins not just because i play violin it's unique for this quintet because all of a sudden you find yourself in some kind of a gypsy romanian hungarian world which he never gives to you either before or after but he does not forget his ability to achieve an enormous climax in the middle of all of this and that part of his writing is truly wagnerian as we'll hear in my last example from the quintet Again, you get these Wagnerian waves of sound and he's changing key almost every half measure. And when he finally reaches that big moment, you almost feel as if a piano quintet could not possibly contain all of the sound that's spewing forth out of just five instruments. The golden age of Hollywood borrowed a lot of these techniques, but he did it first. It's something that you hear in Korngold, it's something that you hear in the great scores of Rosa, and this is uh, something that came first. So I'm really, really thrilled to be able to play this work. Uh, it's not something that's really in the standard repertory. I think the audience will agree that this is a wonderful piece of music and it should be played more often. And we're really thrilled to present it at this concert. Indeed, but I could not possibly sign off on the bridge without pointing out that one of the reasons it's infrequently performed is that it is just a bear of a piano part. You really need the stamina of the Rachmaninoff Third Concerto to play through this piece, but it's got to be a glorious sense of accomplishment to be able to do it with four string players like the ones we're going to hear this afternoon. Lori, thank you so much for all of your insight. This is a, a really wonderful way to introduce this work and introduce this concert. My pleasure, Gary. Enjoy.
subscribe to our YouTube channel where the event will take place.